We got a great guest for you guys now. He's in the middle of an election that happened last week. What? As my kids would say. So New York's 12th district, Siraj Patel, and he was running against Carolyn Maloney, and he still is. The race is too close to call. So Siraj, welcome to the Young Turks. Hey, thanks for having me again. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, no problem. So let's review, because this is a little complicated. The election was last Tuesday. Uh, we have a general sense of uh, some of the other folks who won in New York, like uh, Jamal Bowman, and we cel- celebrated and Mondaire Jones, and we celebrated those progressive victories. Uh, you are uh, challenging Carolyn Maloney, who is another incumbent, who is not as progressive, let's say. Um, so, but your place, uh, race is too close to call. Um, so, what is the current status of it right now? So, the election ended on Tuesday. Um, but because of vote by mail, um, 39,000 ballots were cast uh, over the early vote period and on Tuesday last week. And after those ba- ballots were counted, um, I am down by 650 votes with what we uh, figure is an approximately another 35 to 40,000 ballots in the mail left to count. Uh, that won't happen until next week. Yeah, and so it's 1.6%. I did the math in my head right just now. Kidding, I looked it up earlier. Um, so so obviously it's very, very close. Um, and, and so do I have this part of the math right? So you're saying 39,000 already counted, but there's another 35,000 or so left to be counted. So it's only about 50% reporting, is that right? That's exactly right. That's why it's just absolutely too close to call. Um, and our whole goal on this campaign going forward is to make sure that every single vote is counted. Um, and so, you know, we've got a um, a system in New York where our boards of elections are in all three different boroughs, and so we just have to stay on top and and watch these ballots be counted. And so, how do you do that? Because I saw that you wanted the courts to uh, to get involved here. So, how do you want the courts to get involved? Are, are you worried about the vote counting? And what's the ideal way to do it? Yeah. Um, so actually, we you know filed a suit that is very commonplace for anyone. I, I believe Rep. Maloney will file file the same suit. If you want a seat at the board of elections table when the votes are counted, you have to file a claim. So we have done that. Um, and so what's going to happen is next week, I think on Monday, they'll start opening up these ballots at all three different board offices, and um, and then scan them in. The ballots can be invalidated if the signature on the outside is missing or wrong or some other technicality. And so one of the things we're going to make sure and then do is is to make sure that as, as you know all the ballots are counted um, and watch over so that no one invalidates ballots based on signatures and technicalities, things like that. Um, so it's going to be a, you know a long process. There's no doubt. And I wish I'd had some more closure on an election after after running such a long one. But at the same time, um, you you mentioned it, Mondaire, um, uh, you know Jamal. Like it, this was a change election across New York and and frankly across the country. People are rejecting a failing status quo. They saw COVID. They saw uh, you know how our healthcare system uh, needs a complete overhaul. How the inequities in our economy and economic opportunity. Um, really, really, you know, befall when something like COVID happens. The working people and working class and small businesses. Um, and then I think, you know, at the end of this race, we saw a massive civil rights movement, uh, you know, awakening before our eyes with George Floyd. And people recognize that the way things have been going uh, aren't acceptable anymore. The status quo is just failing, and that's evidenced by the fact that, um, you know, uh, someone like Elliot Engels lost. Uh, someone like Carol Maloney can't, you know, is somewhere around 40% in her race in her district after spending three million dollars, um, a ton of corporate PAC money, super PAC dark money, uh, all those things, and still. And so it shows you that um, th- this is a time for change. 2020 is a year for change, and voters are soundly rejecting the status quo across the board. So, Suraj, uh, you ran uh, two years ago as well. In in that race, you lost by 20 points. In this race, we got a tie. Plus, there was two other progressives in the race um, that got a decent amount of vote. Uh, Lauren Ashcraft got over 10 points. Uh, and so that makes it much harder, yet you still closed a big gap. 
So what do you think was the difference in those two years? Why do you think this this race is so much more competitive? Um, great question. And truth is, uh, you know, uh, Lauren and Peter ran excellent races, and our district is one that is very diverse, dynamic. Um, it's 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 educate. It's the most educated district in the country, and so people are very discerning. They research their candidates and and they look. Um, you know. We had three progressives in this race. Our positions on Medicare for all, on Green New Deal, all those things are the exact same. We were branded different, but um, uh, you know, I don't consider myself DSA. But other than that, um, three progressives, which means again, the biggest lesson to be learned is how soundly rejected the status quo was. You know, um, but to your point, we knew we had uh, other progressives in the race, and because of that. We knew the only way to win was to persuade a lot of Maloney voters, persuade what are typically um, voters who don't go for an insurgent um, to, to switch sides and not just go and mobilize people who agree with us. And I think I learned that lesson two years ago, Cenk. I ran obviously um, and, and ran a very, very hard progressive campaign. But in our district, you know, that wasn't enough. And we learned really honestly that we have to persuade 70% of the vote in our district comes from Manhattan. And you know that's not your typical, um, you know, where we have Brooklyn, we have Queens, where we have a lot of really strong left-leaning support. Um, you know, in Manhattan, you've got to you've got to persuade voters who are, uh, by and large, want reform, and and in this case, wanted big change. But you've got to get them comfortable with what that change means. And we did that. Suraj, I'm very curious about that then, because you did do it, and you're tied with her now under very very difficult circumstances, and so. Uh, how do you get those older liberals uh, in places like uh, East Manhattan, a uh, very well to do uh, part of town, um, to come in the progressive direction? What, what works? What appeals to them that has them go, oh, I see what you're saying? Yeah, on the two issues of our time, um, you know, first off, I'll say how we started this race. We ran on bold uh, policy ideas. The universal child allowance that I proposed at the start of my race uh, was covered, you know, nationally by CNBC and others. It would half child poverty in the first year alone. Um, the research and uh, discovery moonshot we proposed, the discovery project, uh, would have increased our federal research and development budget to where Apollo levels were. These kinds of like nuanced policy ideas uh, prove to people that you know you're not just taking bumper sticker slogans and and copying pasting. Um, you know, typical our normal policy, Medicare for all, and all that, which we agree with. Uh, we're also working to convince people by putting out novel ideas. And then also on this race, Cenk, we made a million phone calls. Um, we delivered thousands of meals and supplies to seniors during COVID. We stepped in where the con Congresswoman's office disappeared during COVID. We helped people with their unemployment insurance. We helped people uh, with their small business loans. We basically turned into the constituent services shop. Um, we basically started doing the things that uh, that you're supposed to be doing when you're in Congress as as a as a candidate. And then, of course, let's not forget, you know, even you know, no matter where you are, if you're a good progressive, if you're a good liberal, uh, you know that that racial, um, uh, you know, systemic oppression in our criminal justice system and police brutality has to stop. It doesn't matter how much you earn. If you're a good liberal, you believe that. And towards the end of this race, we were really able to convince a lot of people that. Um, Sending somebody who was an architect of mass incarceration, someone who voted for 94 crime bill, who celebrated it, someone who voted for mandatory minimums multiple times in her career, someone who voted with the Republicans to create ICE, voted with the Republicans to build a border wall in 2006. That person cannot be the person in the middle of a civil rights uprising to lead us out and to fix the criminal justice system. You know, and so we really, really pointed out. Uh, that the representative's record isn't just not progressive. In many cases, her record on social issues is not even today really democratic. How did you get that to stick? So, for, I, because Bernie did not emphasize the 94 crime bill, which uh, Biden uh, is one of the principal architects of. And so, uh, whereas it apparently you had some traction with that against Maloney. So, I wonder if there's a lesson to be learned there. Yeah, I think that I absolutely think that there was obviously the moment met the argument um, towards the end of this election with the protests and everything happening right in the last two weeks. I would also say that the um, distinction here is obviously I'm a lawyer. I worked with the ACLU. I we talked about this issue not just this year, but two years ago when I ran too. 
Um, and Rep Maloney, I think her record isn't just bad, it's really bad on this issue. So much so that two years ago when I ran against her and I said Black Lives Matter, um, Rep Maloney went on to defend Ray Kelly and wrote an op-ed a few years back uh, citing Ray Kelly as an excellent choice for Trump's FBI director. Now Ray Kelly, for those of you who don't know, not New Yorkers, was like, is a major uh, um, proponent of stop and frisk. And the way he implemented it as police commissioner was found unconstitutional. So this is a person who's tied intricately with um, with with tough on crime politics, you know? Yeah, all right, so whether it is in a couple of weeks or a couple of years, uh, future Congressman Suraj Patel, thank you for joining us, we appreciate it. Uh, and good luck with the, with the count. Thank you, thank you so much for having me and I appreciate it. Like what you see, click the subscribe button below and don't forget to ring the bell to never miss another video from the Young Turks.